Talking to Death is released weekly, every Wednesday, and brought to you absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, subscribe to Tenderfoot Plus at tenderfootplus.com or on Apple Podcasts. Talking to Death is a production of Tenderfoot TV and iHeart Podcasts. Listener discretion is advised. It's talking to death. No, you need a mic, buddy. Oh, fuck. <laughs> what? <laughs> now that's actually kind of funny. That that proves that it's been that I've had a couple weeks off. It's been a while. Uh, I had my first big goof. Let me let me just run that back. It's talking to death, but it's 2024. I the thing about 2024 is I felt like it was already 2024. <laughs> I think we were all ready for 2023 to be over. It's it went on too long, right? I feel like it's a tired joke. The whole like, hey, like 2016 from two th- like that was so long ago. It's like I, I just stopped counting. I mean, call it 24, call it 25, whatever. But we're here now. It's a brand new year. We're all gonna create these goals and never see them through. Everyone's gonna stay unhealthy and broke. <laughs> just I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We're all gonna win this year. I'm excited to be back on Talking to Death, and I have a guest today, and I'm not just saying this, he's arguably one of the most badass people I've ever met, and he has all the creds to back it up. H- how would you describe this person? Uh, I've been working with him for, uh, I don't know, a little while, for mm-hmm. sure, for the podcast he hosts, but he's awesome. He's also super cool, very cool, down-to-earth, chill guy. Would you want to get in a fight with him? Get in a boxing ring with him? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'd give it a, give it a shot. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. This guy would knock me out so fast. If he's hearing this, he's probably cracking up. We have another Tenderfoot TV podcast called Downrange, and he hosts this show. And it, it's basically a bunch of different stories from people who are in the special forces, and they have the most insane extraordinary tales to tell you and it's all first person and we've really kind of taken you there and created this sonic environment for you to kind of be on the ground with them as they tell these insane stories so his name's Remy Adeleke and he has the most incredible story I don't even want to spoil too much of it because he needs to tell you in his own words how he started and where he is today is special and i think we could all learn something from it remy is a writer author tv personality military consultant for some of the biggest action movies you've ever seen this is michael bay's go-to dude he helps michael bay get it right let's put it that way and he's just uh inspirational and i don't say that about a lot of people i sometimes find myself getting annoyed these days with every single person on the internet telling you what your mantra should be or think this way about life. If you want to just look at somebody and listen to somebody who truly has an inspirational story and has overcome a lot, this is that person. For me, he's the kind of person, if you're in the same room as him, you want to do better because he just gives off that energy. (laughs) Not to mention... He's hilarious. <laughs> He's absolutely hilarious. I wanted to really go there. I wanted the real deal story. How, how did you how did you get here, man? And he goes into detail about coming from the streets of New York and being the ultimate badass in Hollywood today. And it reminds you that, shit, as corny as it sounds, anything's possible. And if you don't think that, then go listen to this guy's interview and then I, you might think differently because... You got it, and you see now. Now I'm starting to sound like him. Yeah, you are. See, yeah, yeah, I'm like now I'm embodying this guy. <laughs> but he's right. He's right. No, but he's right though. Is the thing we met in L.A. and we sat outside during this interview, and he was kind enough to give us uh, a brand new copy of his book, which was cool. Um, it's called Chameleon. Oh, there it is. Got it right here. There it is. I'm reading it. It's great. Were you, did you plan this or did, what is this? No, I actually want to read more. I have been reading more, and this is one on my list. And the action is real you know it's authentic action in there so this one's fiction he has another book that's like his memoir but this one's like this one's called chameleon Mm -hmm. and it's a fiction book and it's an action i think thriller and i'm i'm stoked about it that's that's the real deal shit 
anyway, this guy is is a whole lot of fun. Um, I had a blast, and he honestly was just cracking me up the whole time. His name is Remy Adeleke, and I know for a fact you're going to love this interview. And if you do, which I know you will, please go check out our new podcast called Downrange, which is available right now. You can binge the whole thing. And he hosts this podcast. You won't regret it. It's a, a very engaging listen. Uh, our, our sound designer, Cooper, went extra in. All the editors here, you included, you, everybody, they really busted their ass and made a, a cinematic experience and brought these stories to life. And I'm just thrilled for you to meet Remy, the real Remy, behind the curtain. Without further ado, wait, what episode is this? Shit. <laughs> this is what this is what happened. You take two weeks off. It's a brand new year. And you forget who you are. Oh, the calendar doesn't say, so it's... Yeah. It, all I know is it's, it's 2024. What, what is, is it? today? Okay, are you sure about that? 100%. <laughs> He's like, 100%. He's like, I think, I'm pretty sure. It could be seven or nine. Episode eight, here we go. Remy Adeleke, you're going to love this. Cheers. So, Remy. Yo, what's up? What's up, man? Have <laughs> me on, bro. Hey, dude. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. We're rocking the glasses. Let's, yeah, let's yeah. Go with we're it. out here in sunny Southern <laughs> California. Even though we're in the shade. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta say, of all the people that I know personally, yeah, you might be one of the most badass dudes. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm being serious. I appreciate it. What does it mean to be a Navy SEAL? Um, it means to be someone who will get knocked down a million times, get dragged through the mud, get thrown off a cliff, uh, get thrown in the fire, uh, get shot up, beat up, every worst thing that you can imagine happen to you, but still keep fighting, still keep going. That's what it means to be a frog man. Um, it's that, uh, that will and that spirit to be a freaking Terminator. And it all, and it all, uh, it starts up here. You know, when a lot of people think of Navy SEALs, they think about the physicality, the ability to shoot, um, dive, jump, uh, be physical, do pull-ups, do run millions of miles. But at the end of the day, that's just a small piece of it. It's all about the mental. Because why you why can't, is that, though? That's just how they vet us. That's how they vet guys um, through the basic underwater demolition seal training uh it's absolutely relentless they throw absolutely everything at us including the kitchen sink and every guy that shows up to the program has what it takes physically to make it through okay. because we have to pass a physical screening test and got to do 500 yard swim a mile and a half push-ups i mean mile and a half run push-ups sit-ups pull-ups all that stuff so if you pass that then you've essentially told the navy that you are physically qualified to be a frogman that's just a starting point that's just a starting point the question is do you have what it takes mentally and what the instructors do in training is they use physical tools to drive home intellectual points it's all mental and so that's that's what a seal is a seal has an impenetrable mind and the majority of guys don't make it through the program. I mean, attrition rate is anywhere between 80 and 90%. The class that I graduated with started out with 270. Mm -hmm. Only 29 of us graduated. Wow. And that's the way it is every class. So I think there was a recent class that just finished Hell Week, which is like the fourth week of training. Uh -huh. And it was only like 16 guys. And that class started out with over 200 dudes. Damn. And so what? why is that the case is because it's all about the mental. And I remember there was a guy in my class he was a triathlete. I mean, he was a well-known triathlete. I mean, he could run miles fast. He could swim fast, right. physically, a physical stud. He quit like in the first week of training, right? He had what it took physically, but he didn't have what it took mentally. And so that's what it means to be a frogman, to, to, to keep pushing, to get knocked down, to see a mountain, to see an obstacle and either find a way around it or run through that wall to get it on the other side. So clearly not everyone has this mental thing you're talking about. Yeah. What separates those who do and those who don't? No one knows. No um, one knows. You know, they've had, I remember when I was in Buds, they would have like, I don't want to use an incorrect term, but like scientists and okay. psychologists and psychiatrists sure. come and monitor us and watch us to try to figure out 
what is it that sets this person apart from this person? Why is this guy making it huh. who's like 150 pounds soaking wet, <laughs> looks like a nerd, but this <laughs> right. dude who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> right. ain't lasting a day. And they haven't been able to figure that out because at the end of the day, you can't tell what's in a person's heart. Um, and, and it's not until you get thrown into the fire that you see how people respond. As a matter of fact, I own a um, company where I run pro athletes, collegiate athletes, uh, and Olympians, and even some corporate entities through, through our pipe, through a very watered down version <laughs> of the what PG we 13 version. Yeah. Oh no. Rated G dude. <laughs> I tell the guys Disney all the version. Time, oh yeah. yeah. Disney version for sure. But it's still cha a challenge. Oh, right? sure. And, uh, you know, I was, I was running training St. Mary's rugby team over the weekend and Saturday on Saturday, this past Saturday. And, uh, same thing as in training, you get all of these guys, you throw everything at them and you'll see guys who are just, horrible like they're not performing but you see their true colors okay and interestingly i got a text message from the coach on the way up here and he was like dude like there was so many things that we didn't so many sides of people that uh -huh. we never saw wow until yesterday and there's one guy in particular who we were texting he was like he's he's gone like the the team captains after they saw what happened yesterday and how he just He's this tough guy, right, on the exterior. He's that, I'm a ride or die yeah. when the situation comes down to it. But when he was thrown into the fire, dude jumped out real quick, you know? And so you can't tell what's in a person's heart until you put them to the test, till you put them in a situation that exposes their heart, that exposes their true colors. And that's what SEAL training does. It exposes who's who in a zoo. You know, you can't hide. <laughs> Nobody can't hide, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? So... Yeah. I mean, even if the scientists can't figure it out yet. Yeah. I mean, looking at you and your life and how your brain works mm -hmm. and your experiences, why do you think that you have that and some people don't? What makes your mind different? Or is that something that you learned and self-taught? Is that based on your upbringing? I think, I think it's everybody's different. I think for myself personally, mm -hmm. I think I had it, I would say 80% slash 20%. So 80% my upbringing and having gone through a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. um, leaving Africa, um, being rich in Africa, then losing everything. What happened? So my dad, he was a um, very successful engineer, mm -hmm. multimillionaire. He engineered one of the first man-made islands in the world. Wow. It exists to this day. It's known as Banana Island. It was supposed to be a place where people could do business in Africa, like legitimate business, like high-end business. Okay. So he wanted to create like an African Wall Street. And so that's what, it wasn't named Banana Island. The name of it was Lagoon City. And so my dad, he, there's a lot more to the story, but to kind of shorten it, he uh, hired Dutch engineers. He got this swamp, this lagoon. It, the nice word is lagoon. But what it really was, was it was a swamp, <laughs> like literally a trash. Cause there's like a lot of people think of in America, you know, we, we have a trash system, but a lot of people don't know that most, a lot of countries yeah. don't have a coordinated trash system like us mm -hmm. and, and trash and uh, sanitary rules like we have. And so, you know, we're talking, we're talking that late seventies, early eighties, you know, I mean, I remember being in Nigeria a, few, a couple years ago and I was taking a boat to this news station and there were these little islands that were trash islands and they were like pigs like they and kids running. There. Yeah, well, the trash just kept on flowing up because people just throw their trash in the water and it goes on to these small little islands where people live and the islands is just mm. are just trash, yeah. right? And so it was a swamp and my dad essentially said, hey, I want to buy the swamp. Everybody laughed at them because they were like, what are you going to do with a swamp? Right. My dad was very forward thinking. He was educated in the West, uh, went to the University of London, got his bachelor's and master's in architecture and engineering. He was on the board of the World Trade Center in New York City. He was on the board of the British Financial Planning Count Council mm -hmm. in the UK. So my dad was very smart. intelligent, super yeah. smart, very forward thinking. Um, and so when they said, what are you going to do with this swamp? He said, don't worry, just give it to me. And uh, the reason why he wanted the swamp was because 
He figured that if I create something where there never was something, then no one could ever come along and take it because we don't have in Nigeria, they're not like rights laws, like property okay. ownership laws like there is, like there are here. Like they'll go scoop shit up. Yeah, where the government could come in, we could you start yeah, a business and then, hey, right. this is mine, you know, uh-huh. or a corrupt politician could find some type of loophole and be like, oh, well, that doesn't really belong yeah. to you. And that's, again, there's a lot to the story, but that's what happened to him with his first part property called Marigo, you know, was worth eight million uh, pounds, you know, just for inflation. And he bought that. And then long story short, he ended up getting a swap. So. He hired Dutch engineers, dredged the foreshore, and uh, um, created uh, Lagoon City. But after the land had formed and he started construction, he had construction companies building buildings and and uh, properties on the island. That's when the Lego state government conveniently came in and said the federal government was never supposed to sell you this swamp. They said because it was a certain distance off of the mm-hmm. off of the Lego state that still belonged to them. So that was all that. I mean, that was just straight up corruption because they knew. I mean, it's not like he was doing anything under the radar. It was yeah. all. I mean, I mean you, there's people flying in, all kinds of you know there's stuff going on, stuff going on, and then all of a sudden now you're saying the federal government couldn't sell you that. And so, um, so what'd that do? He went. He started fighting the government. Died three weeks later. Wow. And uh, and there were a lot of people that were outside of his circle, but also inside of his circle that benefited from his death. And, how, and how so? people, you know, the guy who was my dad's personal security guard, he's now still the, to this day the manager of the island. You know, so what people, happened to your dad, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it's a lot to the story, but in short, he was poisoned. He, really? Yeah, he was bitten by a dog. By someone else or something? By someone, yeah. He was bitten by a dog got medication it was bad long story oh, short God. it was bad medication um and um he took the medication on autopsy report said that hey what killed him ultimately was the medication yeah um and then everybody swooped in and was able to hold on to the property and now it's a uh it's a um residential island it's like beverly hill so the, the richest some of the richest africans in the world and the richest African Nigerians in Nigeria mm-hmm. have mansions and properties on that island. So, so clearly your dad was right with his, oh, his yeah. forward thinking of the value of this place. Oh, yeah. His vision for it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And how old were you when this all happened? I was five. Five. So what did that, what did that do to you? Well, now, you know, I tell people all the time it was a it was a curse. But at the same time, it was a blessing because. Did it feel like a blessing at the time or is no, that hindsight? No, absolutely not. Just looking back, because I wouldn't be the man I am today mm-hmm. if that didn't happen to me. My mom, she's American, so she brought my brother and I back to the States, mm-hmm. New York City. First time there? Uh, no, 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 no. We had, we, we had a property in New York. Okay, okay. And so we would go back and forth. We would travel to London all of the time. Mm-hmm. We would travel to Paris, so we traveled all over. Um, and so she grew up in New York City. She was born and raised in the city. So when my dad died, she was like, hey, I'm going to bring my family, my two boys, back to what I know, which is New York. And my mom, she did a real good job of masking the reality of what had happened. She would dress up our apartment the best she could and keep try to keep us in our apartment and away from the streets at a very young age. Um, when we would go downtown, she would save up her pennies and then take us downtown. And we would just jump on the express bus, go straight downtown, uh-huh. and then go to like a museum. And she would get jobs at like museums and art galleries so we can go for free. She would like wow. get jobs at playhouses so that we can go for free. That Part way. Of New she, York, were you in? The Bronx. Bronx. Yeah, I was okay. in the Bronx. Yeah, we were in the Bronx. And this is a crack epidemic as well, the, the height of it. What, what was it like back then in the Bronx? Uh, it was crazy. I mean, it was, it was crazy. It was, um, there was prostitution. Mm-hmm. There were, um, I remember being a kid going into the local bodegas and seeing the mafia guys come in with their big collars to collect tax. Uh-huh. Um, there were, you know, there was murders, um, all kinds of drug dealing. I mean, in the park I grew up in, I grew up next to, DeVoe Park, you would see drug dealers just selling drugs to crackheads, crackheads strung out everywhere. Um, and that was, that was the environment. It was a very rough, rough area. For sure. I mean, you, you clearly prevailed through this difficult time as a as a young kid. Yeah. And how did you do that? Uh, well, my mom, I would say my mom, mm-hmm. um, she did the best she could to keep me away from 
a lot of what was going on outside of our co-op where we lived. Um, but then as I grew older and I got influenced by hip hop culture and rap culture and street culture, mm -hmm. that's when I began to diverge. So yeah, man, I, I got out of control and um, got into selling drugs. Mm -hmm. so, well, I started out stealing. So you, and so you did start doing that. I did start I doing say, that. Like, back in the days where you were listening to Snoop Dogg yeah. on the tape and trying to hide it from your mom. Yep. And she doesn't want you to go down the route of some of the things that they're saying in these exactly. songs. And where were you at with that? Were you looking at that like, hey, maybe I'll I'll trap and do whatever? Or like, where was your headspace me, at? My mindset you... was like, I want to get money. Okay, by by any means necessary. By any means necessary. Right. And the only, These guys do it this way, so. And this is the way they do it. And I'm not trying to go the long route, which is go yeah. to high school, get good grades. Right. Go to college. I see it. Get out here. of college, get out of masters. I see a quick, a get rich quick scheme. Sure. You know? And uh, and so, yeah, I started out s slow, s stealing, going into bodegas, stealing chips, stealing candy, selling it. Okay. Getting, I got a, I got a job at a, just like to other school vans or other, something. Other, other, yeah, other kids. Yeah, yeah. I got a job at a sneaker store. I would steal the sneakers from the sneaker store, mm -hmm. um, and sell them for cash. Yeah. At a at a discounted rate. Then I would take the old shoes from the people who I bought. I sold the show shoes to put them in a the box, take the box back to the store, put it in a defect sh section. I found all kinds of crazy ways to make money. Sure. And then eventually I got into selling drugs. And then finally, um, this is when I, I came across my cell phone uh, hustle. And that's where I was making what's, what's way the cell more phone money. Hustle? So I was, at the time, cell phones just came out. This is 2000 not just came out, but that's when they became more widespread mm -hmm. and, and more accessible. Um, so I would get people's credit information, mm -hmm. full name, date of birth, social security uh, number, address. I didn't need the address, but those were the main three, the first three name, date of birth, social. Mm -hmm. And then I had access to activate three phones on one person's line of credit, depending on how their credit was. So you just was. go into a store and do this? No, so I got a job at a okay. company because there was another dude who told me about it okay, and he was it. hustling and doing it. And so I was able to qualify to get a license. So I got a license for this specific company. I'm not mentioning the company yeah, name for a reason. We don't have to go there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would I would activate the phones. So I had I would just call in and be like, hey, this is here's my identification number. I'm Remy at a lake AI for such and such company. My identifier is XYZ, whatever. Okay. And they was like, okay, what 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 name and address, what information you have for us? And what what does this customer want? Oh, they want three phones. Oh, cool. So I would give it to them so they would activate and I would have the phones. I would get the boxes of the phones because this company would provide the boxes of the phones and I okay. would and once the once the uh, line of phones were approved, then I would get a uh, I would give them the the serial number that was on the code, send it to them and then they would activate the phone. And it was all legit. So you would just sell these active phones? I would phones sell to... these phones. They were called blow-up phones. I would sell them to drug dealers. Like burner phones, basically. Yeah, burner phones, uh, blow-up phones. I would sell them to drug dealers. And I would sell them to friends and family. And, and drug dealers liked them because um, the phones would stay on for up to 90 days. Yeah. So you had, so after the first 30 days, uh, a customer would get a bill. Then they had to the 60-day mark to pay that bill. And if it wasn't paid, so they by wouldn't the, notice for like three months. Is what you're saying? Well, I got hip to the game, and I would get uh, people's information who was in hospice. Okay, hospice. so it's, it was just going unnoticed. Going unnoticed. So I say, like, wouldn't they say, "Hey, this guy activated three phones," unless you, you didn't notice that? Well, I was smart about it too, where I would have like legitimate customers, mm -hmm. but then I would also have like a, a quota of like how many illegitimate customers I had, because at the end of the day, as long as I had a signature. Nobody knows who whose signature it is, but True. as long as I had a signature, hey, this person wanted to get the phone. They just didn't pay their bill in ninety days. In order to investigate all of that, you took you, like somebody would. And this, again, it's confusing. Why it worked right? out so, in yeah. my favor was cell phones weren't like the thing. Yeah, this it's not like it, it wouldn't is work now. that way now. No, no absolutely it, it not. It couldn't work probably. Yeah. Absolutely not. It, everything was fresh back then, so it, I was making crazy money. I was making mm -hmm. up to like ten grand a week. Damn cash. You Damn. Know what I mean, um, and. Uh, and that, and that's when I was like, sell drugs. Nah, why do that when this is less risky? And on top yeah. of that, I was getting bonus checks because 
At your legit job. <laughs> at my legit job uh -huh. for phones that I sold illegitimately. <laughs> right. Double dippings. I was like the salesman of the quarter. So why stop doing that? Well, you did stop. When did you end up stopping? And you know, why I was that. So I, uh, music was, as I mentioned earlier, was a big part of me and a big influence on me. So I got into the music game. So my goal was to start a record company, which I did. Mm -hmm. I started a record company, got some artists. I was using that money. I had an exit plan. My exit plan was do what Jay did and 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 Dame Dash and 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 Biggs. Do the do the legal thing to get into the music game. Once you get into the music game, then from there, you let that go mm -hmm. and you go legit. So that's what all the money was for. So I was paying for studio time. I was, me and my artists were going down to to, to uh, Virginia and recording down there. And also I was paying a, a producer down there to make beats. Yep. Um, I was paying for shows, gear for shows and all that stuff. That's where all the money was going to. And uh, fast forward, I ended up getting into it. This is... 2001 December 2001 I sold uh, a drug dealer a bunch of phones now I'll back up for a second when he approached me he wanted to buy bulk he he started out as a customer where I would just sell one two every 90 days mm -hmm. but then he saw how much money I was making and then he was like yo can I buy like 20 at so a he time you flip yours so that he could flip so if I because I was selling them between 500 and 900 a phone and I was selling, selling the time port Motorola two-way pages the, the gray ones that were big at the time mm -hmm. and so what I later found out is that he would then in return double the price or add you know 25 percent to the price and then sell them and when he approached me about it I said no or originally I was like absolutely not I'm not yeah selling you 20 phones that's that's just crazy that's yeah. just too too odd i did because if i did that with you then i would have to pull i would have to cut a lot of like customers that a lot of my regulars mm -hmm. right because i'm not going to activate uh, if the number of t i was doing in a month was 20 which it wasn't i'm not going to activate 40 phones right you know in one week that's nuts right you know that's too hot now the risk is also in his hands a little bit but it went through your hands yeah well now the risk is all in my hands right still in your hands it's still on my yeah. hands because that's that's my license that i'm using he, yeah and 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 he goes over he walk, runs away scot-free so it was more yeah, of yeah. a better deal for him safer for him it was way safer for him so um i said no and then he kept on pressing pressing finally i was like all right let's try this out and sold him some phones and uh, like a month later, he hit, he like doesn't just, he knocks on my mom's apartment door. Damn. I'm like, man, who's knocking on mom? It's late. It's around Christmas. Open the door, it's him. And he had the phones. And he was like, yo, the phone's cut off. And when he said that, like, like he was like in a very threatening mood, had a gun under his waist and everything. He was trying to show it to me, like scam me. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like, but I, I was more, yeah, I was more petrified. I didn't like, I knew I could deal with him. With him. I'd get him the money. That was an issue. I was scared to death that I was going to go to federal prison because there were some people in the same kind of office I was working in that got caught. The dude who put me onto it, he put other people onto it and they got caught and they were getting charged. And so... You got this guy is running around knocking on doors late at night who's a... So, yeah, so I'm thinking the feds are on to me. Yeah. Because the first thing that Frank told me and obviously I'm changing the name, but the first thing Frank told me when I got it, when he showed me how to hustle this way with the phones is you get caught fed time. You get caught fed time. This is a federal crime. This isn't no small claims. This is a federal crime. And so that was the first thing that popped in my head. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so I got him his money. And then I was, after that, I was like, I'm done with all of this. Yeah. I kind of created this, wrote a letter to the people in the office I was working with saying, hey, I'm quitting. In my naive mind, I figured that if I write this letter <laughs> and then they find out the investigation two weeks later, yeah, yeah then, they, then they'll, uh, then they'll let me him. off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and then, um, so that was kind of how it all. So that's spooked you basically. Down. And spooked you're like, me. okay, I'm about to lose everything. Yeah, That's bullshit man. right here. Yeah, yeah. And I could have lost my life. I could have lost my yeah, life dealing real. with him. I had the money because I was making money. I had the money, gave him his money back. But I could have lost my life. And then I could have lost my life in the sense of like literally, but then also figuratively in this, in, in the, in, by going to prison. 
Yeah. And uh, so that's when I decided I'm done with everything. And again, going back to my mom and discipline, one thing, my, my mom would spank me and my brother. Mm -hmm. Like, she wasn't abusive, but like... Oh, my dad would spank me, bro. Yo, yeah, she would give it to me, bro. She was like, yo, extension cords, belts. I'm bro, oh, yeah, the belt was always the closest it. thing nearby yeah. that yeah. made sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the what that did for me was that instilled in me this concept of consequences for actions. Yes, 100%. So I knew at some point I'm going to get, there's going to be a consequence for these actions. You can get in trouble. Yeah. And serious right, trouble. By your actions. And, and so when that, when that happened, the phones cut off, that was like a spanking. And I didn't know what was going to come of it, but that was enough for me to say, okay, a consequence came. Another one may can't come then that, that's going to be worse. Yeah. So I'm done. So if it wasn't for what my mom, those small little things my mom instilled in me at a younger age, right. I would have I would have continued on. And so my mom taught me, hey, you better at some point you are going to have to stop. And that was instilled in me. And that's something that I try to instill in my kids when it comes mm -hmm. to certain, even if it's something as simple as whining. Like, you ain't gonna nah, nah, you ain't about to whine. Cause usually for, you're for whining minutes. to get something. To get what you want. Right. To get what you want, usually. But you need to As know that that's not the response right. that, that you give. That works less and less the older you get. Exactly. And you're not going to get anything from it. So you need to stop. Mm -hmm. And I think that what that can morph into later is people who are just, they don't know how to express their emotions and they have a breakdown when they don't get what they want. Because yeah, before, whining yeah. is how they were able to break down their parents. They learned they that, want. right. Now they get into the real world, and you can't whine in the real world, so what do you have? A meltdown. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's like a learned behavior that's unhealthy. Exactly, exactly. So you, you stop the fraud, you yeah. stop selling drugs, yeah. and at some point along the line- I joined the Navy. You joined the Navy. Yeah. And so why did you want to join the Navy? Um. It was because I finally realized that if I don't get out, like I had, I had, I gave up all the hustling and I was doing nothing for six months. Okay. Um, and I think what it boiled down to, there's a lot more to the story. It's all in my book, Transform, but what it really boiled down to was I felt stuck. Like I felt like I didn't want to go to college mm -hmm. because that was cheesy. My brother was in college at the time. He was, yeah, it, it, it was that, again, this is no, the it's mentality, it's, yeah, it's, right? It's like, yeah, yeah, you're like, I don't want, I'm gonna be, I, I don't want to be a herb. That was, that was, that was <laughs> right. like, the, yeah. you know, I, it's kind of <laughs> cheesy to, uh -huh. you know, go to college and this study nerd the over books, here. yeah, and 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 then and then like be broke and be <laughs> struggling and like, what am I gonna have? Yeah, to get girls and what am I gonna have to get attention? You know, another thing I'll back up for a second is. The reason why fathers are important is because of affirmation. Like every child needs to be affirmed by both parents, but I, I truly believe that a father's affirmation is very powerful. But you didn't have that I, after a certain point. I didn't have that after a certain point. And so I say all that to say, when kids don't have get that affirmation, they seek to get it from other places. And so I wanna say that the root of, of why I did a lot of the things that I did, when it, Start starting out from stealing some chips and some candy from the store to be able to sell it. So all these kids would be like, oh, that's right. Yeah, you were, candy that was man. affirmed by this guy's. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So affirmation. And then that progressed to other things. And then when I got in my late teens, now it's like, oh, I got this money. I got this car. I'm driving a Lincoln LS. Brand new car. Bought it off the lot. Yeah. I'm still in my teens. And Damn. girls are like, I'm getting affirmation. My boys are like, yo, you the man. I'm getting affirmation. And so. That's one of the things that I was seeking. You see, I mean, you see it in even pro athletes. I mean, even music stars, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like in the hip hop industry, yeah. it's like, why Why do you need the diamond chain and right. all of this stuff? You want to have made it. Exactly. But you also, you want people to affirm you. I think that's something that's unconscious. I think it's like deep, yeah. deep down inside. Totally. And, um, and so that was one of the reasons why I didn't want to go to college because I felt like everything had been stripped from me financially. Yeah. So how can I be put in a, in a position to get affirmed? Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm going to look like a bum. You know what I mean? Right. So we, we like, if, if I could be a Navy SEAL, 
I that would be affirmation in a, in a no, different way, like not, the challenge of that. And, well, that, not, not, that was solely the reason why I didn't want to go to college. Okay, because that wasn't going to work that th- way. That wasn't going to work that way. But what I what what I I had I, I watched two movies that inspired me to do the seal thing, and that okay. one was Bad Boys because that okay. was the first time I saw two black characters who were heroes, but they were cool. Yeah, and they were they seemed to me like they were me. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like the rappers that were me. Yeah, like Will Smith and Martin Lawrence, they were me. They were cool. They got you know Will was getting the girls. Martin had the. Do you, family. you have a daughter? I got a daughter. My youngest daughter. You're yeah, gonna yeah. be like that scene. Oh, one hundred percent. What are you talking about? Where he goes on the date? Think it's gonna get there. Dude. No, but that shit is so. Funny. <laughs> yeah, it is funny. It's like, that's a classic scene. It's classic. That's a classic scene. scene. It's so funny. Michael Bay messaged me uh, yesterday on Instagram because we really we, we could like he he's what he started me out in the industry in the film and TV business. And you so, do consulting with yeah, consult, scene, or military yeah. scenes and just how the action work, and all of all that, that stuff. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, he got me started in the film and TV business. So very cool. It's funny you bring that up, but um. Um, yeah, so that was why I didn't want to go to college, but I wanted to join the Navy because that was like my only option. I see. Like, I know it's weird. It's like, well, college Navy is still starting at the bottom, but for some reason, Bad Boys was like inspired me, but then The Rock is what really inspired me because that was the first time I was exposed to Navy SEALs. And, you know, when they, I don't know if you remember the movie, but they- You mean the Nick Cage movie? Nicholas Cage movie. Oh, yeah, we watched it recently. Yeah, yeah, movie. yeah, with the Navy SEALs. And it's they, pretty badass. They to go, go to on the underwater- Alcatraz? Yeah, on the underwater vehicle. Yeah. And then they, they go up- It holds up. It's a good movie. Oh, it holds up on, uh, completely. Uh-huh. Um, but those were Navy SEALs that snuck they in. Now, granted, they got killed, but they were Navy SEALs. And, like, when I say they, they were actual Navy SEALs, they weren't actors. Oh, they were. So Michael Bay used actual Navy That's SEALs. That's awesome. So when they're moving through the sewers and all of that stuff, they're moving. Their movements look clean because they're actually Yeah, they're really doing it. And so when I saw that movie, I was like, dang. I was like, this was years before I went to the Navy recruit. I was like, if I ever turn my life around, that's what I'm going to do. Like, but again, it was, like, far-fetched. Were you but, scared at all? No. No, so I went to the Navy recruiter. I was like, when I went to the Navy recruiter, I went to the Marine Corps recruiters first. He wasn't there. There's a whole nother story there. But then I went to the Navy recruiters, and that's what I wanted to do. I told the recruiter, I was like, I want to be a SEAL. Mm-hmm. And she laughed at me and because uh, I was super skinny, and you know the requirement, the requirements to be a SEAL are, are really high. But you know she she helped me get in the Navy, and there's a long again, there's a lot more to the story. But um, she ran my background, found that I had two warrants out for my arrest. I had a warrant in New York, a warrant in New Jersey. Didn't know I had warrants when she told me that. For I was what? Like, I got arrested in a okay. McDonald's. You know, I won't give it away, but okay. the story's in my book. And then <laughs> and then other in your new was, book. No, my old book. Okay, uh, and transform my memoir. Okay, my memoir. But uh, that 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 new book, Chameleon. That's my. That's a. Uh, fi- it's a thriller series. Okay, cool. Um, but uh, but yeah, and she uh, instead of turning me in, she took me to the judges, uh, advocate on my behalf. Both judges expunged my record, and then she nice. snuck me into the navy, and that that's was awesome. kind of how I got in. She died two years later of an autoimmune disease, but wow, but but like that was my angel. But that's good looking and, out. I mean, that's that changed yeah, your life. Oh, 100%. Right? Changed the trajectory of my life. Do you look at it like that? Oh, 100%. I wouldn't be where I'm at today without that, without what you she needed did. that in that yeah, moment. I right? needed that. Oh, I needed someone that. to take a chance on you and help you out. Really. And yeah. And then I needed that also. I needed the, um, I needed that risk. You know, uh, God doesn't make mistakes. I put myself in that position and I truly believe that God knew that I need this dude to be in such a situation when he joins the military mm-hmm. that he's going to act right when he joins. He when doesn't he's in the mess military. it up. <laughs> and she took such a huge risk on me by sneaking me into the Navy right. and getting my record clear that that stuck with me. You can let her down too. When I was in boot camp, I was AJ squared away. I was like, mm-hmm. I'm showing up on time. I'm folding my stuff right. I'm not talking back. Even if somebody disrespects me, I'm not gonna come with that New York attitude. I'm just gonna do it because I can't let her down. Mm-hmm. Because if I let her, because if I get kicked out of the Navy, then the reason why the Navy didn't want me is gonna be justified. Yeah. Right? Because the mm-hmm. Navy didn't want me because they figured if this dude has a record, this dude is not is going to get into the military and act a fool. Mm-hmm. She expunged my record, hid that from the Navy to prove to the Navy if this guy makes it that other people behind him should get the same opportunity. And so for me, it was one of those things where I was I was the tip of the spear as it relates to what she did, and I couldn't screw it up. And I had to make it to the top. I had to 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 uh, to 
to make it in seal tra- into seal training and through seal training and become a frogman so that I could show the world that sometimes people just need a second chance. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people just need a third chance, fourth chance. Sometimes people just need to be willing to give themselves a second chance. Right. You know. Why do they call them frogmen? Because we op- we're able to operate on the uh, on land and on the water. Okay. In the water. It's just literally just like the yeah, yeah. amphibious yeah. nature of yeah. the job. Yeah. What is, or what was the hardest part about Navy SEAL training? Was there like um, a, a thing that stands out where you're like, oh, that one was pretty difficult? For me, it was the cold, you know? Okay. Um, it was just, I didn't have a lot of body fat. I still don't have much body fat, but it was really um, just being in that cold water, man, at yeah. night when it's like 50 50 degrees, 45, and this Pacific Ocean's freezing cold, and then you just land there, and, and, and the instructors are waiting for guys to quit. Mm-hmm. And then in Hell Week, they keep you wet the entire time. They keep you cold and wet the entire time. Oh, my God. And I could take the, I could take the pull-ups. I could take the push-up. I could take the beat-down sessions. I could take the old course, the runs, all that stuff. But that cold water and then the two-mile time ocean swim in the Pacific Ocean with no body fat is brutal. I mean, you got to the point where Either I was borderline hypothermic or hypothermic at the end of at the end of swims. I'm sure because of how cold that water is and my lack of body fat. So that was uh, that was the hardest part for me. I could take the name calling. I mean, the New York, you know, what do they York, say? Oh, I mean, they call. I mean, they call you everything. Give me a good one. Uh, uh, tch, you know, shit bag. I mean, they call you everything under the sun, dude. I mean, <laughs> turd, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, you know, uh, there's so many other ones, but yeah, they, they lay it to everybody. Everybody gets, gets a tongue lashing in, in, in uh, some very uh, uh, articulate ways. <laughs> right, yeah, they're very creative. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's very it. creative, yeah. So the future of your career as a SEAL just Going beyond that, because mm. you, you became one. Yeah, yeah. Like throughout your career, your experiences, what was the most difficult time that you mm. experienced? Challenging time. Um, the most challenging time would be when uh, we, we, a guy died. A guy was KIA, killed in action. Uh, um, I was on a deployment and I was supposed to be in one country but I got pulled to another country to do uh, a specific. So my background, every SEAL has a job like or specialization. So you Mm -hmm. got breachers, snipers, medics. So I was a medic, but I was also a human guy, which stands for human intelligence. So I went to like various um, intelligence schools and learned source handling and uh, other, you know, trade craft type stuff. Um, Like the movies? Uh, kind of, <laughs> kind of, um, uh, a lot more paperwork, a lot more writing. <laughs> right. Um, uh, but you know, I think I excelled in that field because I had the experience from the streets, mm-hmm. you know? So when I was like running sources and you're crafty and, I guess, I, and, or... and, and they were lying to me, somebody was lying to me. I knew they, why I knew they were lying to me uh-huh. or when somebody was, uh, telling me something and holding back, I was able to sense that because I had to learn how to read people in the streets of New York with what I was doing. So it all translated. Um, so I enjoyed it, but I was on this particular deployment in this country because of that skill set, because of the human and, the, and, and being a medic, because it was only eight of us in this particular country. They were our closest QRF, which is a quick reaction force was on another continent. And, uh, um, Outside of us, the only other Americans were at the embassy in this particular country. And so I say all that to say um, we were we were where we were. And um, a buddy of mine was in another place and um, he got killed on an op. And that's tough to be in one place and your buddy, your friend be in another place and get gets killed on an op. So I think, you know. And that happened, that happened another time as well. You know, when I was- You wish you were there, cause you, yeah, you you're wish thinking, you were there. hey, yeah, what, yeah. what could I have done? Or, yeah. you know, just yeah. we're all in this together and we were in, separated at this moment. Yeah, and it's just like, it's, it's, it's just, it's tough. Yeah. Because, I wanna be careful I say this, but we get to the point 
at least for myself, speaking for myself, mm -hmm. after going through all the training and then doing the jobs that we, we do, you almost, you get to the point, again, speaking for myself, where you almost feel impenetrable. And I, and I don't mean in an, in, in an arrogant way, you feel like, oh, we, we're good. We've gone, on, we've gone on a bunch of ops and, you know, and so we have the best training in the world. Like, mm -hmm. you know, so when it come, when it happens, it's almost like a shock. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like, that. like when we, when we, when we sign up, like every dude that signs up, I truly believe that every person that, for the most part, I don't know how it is now, but I know how it is when I joined. Every dude that signed up and woman that signed up, we knew that we could die, right? Because there were wars at the time. And so I think for my generation of people that went in that time, we gave up the fear of death. And then once you start progressing in the military into a combat unit or a special operations combat unit, like that risk, heightens even more so because now you're going out on ops 16 guys in an area where there could be like 300 dudes and you got to sneak in to go get one cat right or you know you're, you're going into situations you know where you can get blown up you're going you're going into the fire mm -hmm. for the most part like that's your job your job is to like and you know that when you're doing into, it. yeah you you're, know it yeah. you're going into yeah this. yeah once you get to once you like again when you join the navy the military Again, I'm speaking for my generation. Yeah. You know that you could, you've had to have given up your fear of death, uh huh. Right, and then once you get into that type of field, a combat unit, like you definitely for sure have to have given up your fear of death, right? Because the chances of you dying is a you know are pretty high. But when when like a guy like myself, when you get to that point where somebody hasn't died and you have the best training in the world, and then somebody dies, it's like a hit. It's like yeah. a shock. Well, probably feel like you're doing it right. We, like, you, we got, yeah. we're, we're doing this. Like, yeah. this is, but then, does it shatter that sort of confidence or something uh, a little bit, or, or make you, what does it do it, mentally? It, you know, we're humans, so I know for me it hurt to lose brothers, you know what I mean? Because it's, we call it the brotherhood for a reason. Like mm -hmm. you're close, I'm closer, I was I'm still to this day, I'm closer to the SEALs that I serve with than I am some of my family members, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so it's one of those things where, you know, it hurts. I remember, you know, the, the death that hurt me the most was Charlie Keating. You know, he got the silver star um, for his actions in Northern Iraq. He was fighting against ISIS, this is 2016. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he was, working with the locals and ISIS overran the border and it was a bad situation and he was he ran into the he ran into the firefight and uh long story short ended up getting sh a, a bullet hit him in the heart he got killed damn and that one that one hurt me the most because I was really really we were in buds together mm -hmm. you know we were in the same boat crew together I'm on the board of his uh, of his foundation the C4 foundation now um which um provides cool services for active duty military. But I say all that to say, it still hurts, you know, because we're human at the end of the day. And so I, I would say that that's the toughest thing, you know, is losing a brother. Do you feel like those experiences sharpened your mental strength? Oh, 100%. I believe that my mental strength was there. I would say 80% it was there because I went through a lot of crazy stuff that we didn't even touch on. I was beat up as a kid. I mm -hmm. I went, you know, called names, picked on. I, I had all kinds. I watched my mom, you know, struggle. There were times where she didn't have enough food to feed herself. She had just enough food to feed my brother and I. Um, <laughs> we would have to wash our, our underwears and socks out with ivory bars of ivory soap because my mom couldn't afford to do the laundry. All of that stuff really strengthened, strengthens a person. Mm -hmm. And it really, re it does one of two things. Even either it, it turns you into a victim, mm -hmm. you know, where it's like, Oh, what was me? My mom, I don't have a dad. We're poor. We got to wash our underwear with, with ivory soap. My mom, uh, what was me? What was me? And you stay in that victim class or you push past that and you become a victor. And I think like every day watching my mom, you know, strive and push through the pain uh, and then and then having to push through that, too. But at the same time, having an everyday example in my mom, my mom would get up at like five in the morning, 
We had 17 floors in our building. She would run the staircase, the fire exit. She would run 17 flights up, 17 that flights up. And then she would, she would um, take a shower, wake me and my brother up, get us ready for school, take us to school, go work her job as a teacher, come back, uh, pick my brother and I up. Uh, my, grand, my grandmother didn't pick us up. She would pick us up come home, uh, help us with our homework, um, go work another job, make dinner, go work another job. Completely hustling. Yeah, but she had to. She was on. Mm -hmm. And she never complained about it. Right. She never complained about it. And, you know, when you have that example mm -hmm. every single day of your life, and then you find yourself in a position that's hard, and you have to persevere, you have no choice. There is no, like for my mom, there was no choice. My mom didn't have, she couldn't be like, oh, well, like let me that go. or what? Yeah, it's like, what else am I going to do? I got these two boys that need to eat every day. Right. Like, what else am I going to do? Yeah. I have to, I have to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so that's the example I had in my mom. So when I found myself in positions where it's like, you can't swim, <laughs> you know, you don't have the academic scores to get into SEAL training, uh, you're super skinny. What's the option? Uh, not, I'm not going to try right. or I'm going to go bust my ass and do what I have to do to get into the program and then bust my ass and do what I have to do to get through SEAL training. It's like, that's the only option. So I think for me, it was ingrained in me via DNA, my mom and my dad, my dad having a, a, a mind that was almost impenetrable where he was just like, when he had a vision, he stuck to that vision, having that from a DNA standpoint, but then now having that nurtured yeah, through my mom, my mom kind of wax on, wax off unknowingly, like teaching me this. And then fast forwarding to now arriving at SEAL training, having the foundation, but then now putting concepts and theories along and, and terms to that and growing it even more so to now where I'm at now, I don't believe that there's nothing I can't do. Like, obviously, I can't fly like that. I was going to say, you know what I mean? You I can fly, dude. Yeah, We're about, I mean, I'm about I can to skydive and, and, and track for a little bit, but, you know, <laughs> I can't, you know, defy gravity. Right. But you yet. Know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe there is some type of magic potion I could create. But the reality is, I know that whatever I put my mind to accomplish, I will accomplish. You believe in yourself. Yeah. And that comes from. From, from my life experience, from being a frogman, and then now then having that added motivation of now trying to um, maintain the standard, once a seal, always a seal. Mm -hmm. So maintain the standard of excellence, maintain my, uh, uh, my promise to honor my fallen brothers and sisters, um, and, and just maintain who I am and my father's legacy and my mother's legacy, you know? And so uh, take all that into account. Now it's like, there's nothing I can't do. Let's say someone who's not a frogman or yeah. who didn't have a an excellent role model role model like yeah. your mother yeah. growing up to kind of remind you yeah. that hey you don't have a choice yeah someone who's struggling with their own mental strength yeah who doesn't have that to call upon yeah, or yeah. reference yeah what's your advice to someone like that two things do hard things. You what do you know, mean do hard things? Do hard things. So for example, I tell young people this all the time. It's like, use a college student as an example. Sure. You're in college. Your professor gives you a paper. That paper's due in a month. Do it in like a day and a half to two days. Like you discipline yourself and you put your, you create your own deadline. But why should you do that? Because that's going to set a reference point for you. That's good because once you accomplish that hard task, that's it, in somewhat of a controlled environment because you're controlling the outcome. Is it about right. the challenging of yourself to it's, do it sooner? It's, yeah, it's challenging yourself to do it sooner. And ch it's, it's just ch finding a way to challenge yourself. Okay. Maybe, maybe for somebody else, it's like getting up at 5 a.m. Sure. And w doing a walk around the block. Sure. I was having a conversation with a lady yesterday who's overweight and she has a lot of different medical issues. Mm -hmm. And one thing I said to her was, Cause she said, you know, I can't give up sweets. I can't give up ice cream. I can't give up that. I said, okay, respect, check. How about you just get up early and do a walk around the block. And maybe instead of having two scoops of ice cream, you have one scoop of ice cream. To me and you, that's easy. But to her, that could be the hardest thing in the world. And so do that. 
Start small in that. And in starting small in that, once you accomplish that goal, guess what? It boosts your confidence a little bit. So the next time you can say, oh, you know what? Maybe I'm going to have a half a scoop of ice cream. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'm going to walk around the block two more times. Maybe you get good, you get good at that. And yeah, you right? get good it's at that. It's automatic now. Exactly. And I think that so many people have forgot the art of just starting. And so that's my first advice to, to, to anybody that's like, hey, I wasn't a SEAL. I wasn't this. I wasn't that. Is just start. Just start and do something that's hard for you. It doesn't have to be extremely hard, but do something that's hard. Build, I got calluses on my hands. You can see the calluses on my hands. Mm-hmm. Dude, how did I get these calluses? I got these calluses from doing pull-ups. Right. You know what I mean? Years of pull-ups. Now, now it's easy for me to grip the pull-up bar before versus when I first started doing pull-ups. Yeah, it's a physical manifestation of yeah. how it got easier. Yeah, but, but, but the calluses, you know, they... they they make it easier, but I had to I had to build up the calluses first. Sure, yeah. You know, so um, the first thing, like I said, I would say is, is start somewhere, and and the second thing, like I would say, is do, make sure that it's something that's a challenge to you. Do you care about your legacy? Yeah, you, everybody should care about their legacy. Why should they care about it? Because it's like you can't when you die. What do you leave behind? Nothing mm-hmm. but your legacy. Even if you leave behind money, that money's going to run out at some point. Right. So you want people to look at what you did and be in- inspired to, to, to be great. Did you help anybody? Did you do inspired anything? Inspired to worth be, Exactly. It? It's not about- What was the point of your existence? Exactly. It's right. not about legacy so that people could be like, oh, this here's this guy, Remy. Right. He was a filmmaker and he did this and Accolades, that. Accolades, nah, 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 nah. It's about here was this dude, Remy, and here's all the lives he's changed through his life. He is what he contributed to this world. Yeah. And now it's my turn to contribute something to this world. Right? Mm -hmm. It's my turn to push past. I truly believe that every single person was created for a specific reason, but not for themselves, not just for themselves. And I, I believe that the world is in such chaos and turmoil because people are operating outside of their giftings and their callings and their design as to what they were called to be and do. Right? We were all created. We, we're all human. So we were all created to service each other in some way. And getting the, the most ostensible example of that I can give is what if somebody was that was cr- uh, created to be a doctor? What if their mind genetically was wired in a way to be a doctor and they become a doctor and they end up in a village where they're saving all of these kids' lives because they follow their giftings and their calling? My dad, his gifting and his calling and what he was created and designed to do in this world was to, to create a place where people from all around the world could come and do proper commerce in Africa. But that got snuffed out by people who weren't falling into their calling. They were just greedy. So they bypassed their callings and their gifts and their purpose in their world to essentially snuff out my dad's. So now other people who would have benefited from those people doing what they were supposed to do are suffering as well. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Because you're going to die. I'm going to die. Everybody listening to this podcast is going to die. That's something that is inevitable. Mm -hmm. But what will you leave behind? And I'm not talking about physical, material things. You know, man, that's why, you know, we talk about, you know, there's a lot of time travel movies, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the thing that always comes up in the time travel movie is, well, if you go back and how does that work? Because if that person went back and changed this. Right. Does it change the butterfly effect kind of thing? Yeah. But, But that's real. Yeah. You know, the butterfly effect, not time travel, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the butterfly effect is real. Yeah. And it's all... But, Action, reaction. Yeah, but so many people... And so imagine where the world would be if everybody was, like, operating in their truthful callings and giftings. Giving more of a shit. And not hating. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Not being worried about, hey, this person has that. Why don't I have that? Right. Well, I should have that. You know what I mean? Not like half-assed in their job, mm-hmm. not half-assing school, like really being in, yeah, being that on a vested. Grand scale, where it's would a we different be? world, really. It's a different world. Like entirely, right? It's a different world, but we don't have that. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? 
They say, man, hopefully this podcast will get out there and people will hear it. They'll be like, damn, more, a million and yeah, million. Right. And we shake up the world. You know <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying? That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, before we wrap, man, yeah. tell me about Downrange. Yeah, so Downrange Podcast is uh, it's a new podcast from Tenderfoot TV. My <laughs> man. Telegraph Creative. <laughs> um, it's an amazing podcast. Um where we're diving into uh, the stories of war fighters, um, men and women who've gone overseas and uh, have some very heroic and inspirational stories. Um, but it's not a traditional podcast where there's an interview, one person's asking a question, another person's responding. It's a very immersive podcast. Um, so there's sound effects, there's actors. Um, this music is very moving. It really sucks you in. Um, it's an experience. That's the best way I can explain it. And I know like I was recording in the studio and obviously all the effects and all that stuff and, and the other person wasn't there, but like I listened and listening to um, Harryman's story uh, uh, over the weekend mm -hmm. and seeing how it all came together, it was just like, wow, man. Yeah, it's really it's cinematic. Really, yeah, it's yeah. very cinematic. Shout outs to Cooper on some of those sound effects. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> shout out to Cooper, man. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an experience and if people want to mm -hmm. kind of get it, uh, behind the curtains look at you know what men and women have gone through overseas um uh, if you want to see behind the curtain in a very unique and uh experiential way this is the podcast for you why do you think it's important for people to hear these stories uh i think it's important because it it shows the country and if we're talking from an american standpoint what people have what service members have gone through right you know uh fighting for this nation you know what i mean um and uh, and and i think you know i think we're living in a time now where um which is very interesting where a lot of people hate their hate america mm -hmm. i ain't talking about people outside america i'm talking about right. people inside right. america right here you yeah. know what i mean and so i think that you know it could really um show people why you know show people like that there are men and women who are literally putting themselves in a position where they could die, but it's in order to protect and safeguard the nation. Yeah. For you, basically. For, for you. For you who hate America. You right. Know what I mean? right yeah, for you yeah. who hate your own. Hater or you know, not. Yeah, hater or not. This is you know what I mean? Fact. And that's what I loved about being in the military is I didn't care about whether somebody was Democrat or Republican or right. whether somebody, whatever the case may be, whether you were man, woman, whatever the case may be, whatever your background. I'm here to protect you. I don't care. Right. I'm here to safeguard you. I don't care. And you know what? If if the general public knew the stuff that has been stopped, if the general public knew like some of the things that could have happened and should have happened where a lot of Americans could have died, but there were people standing in the gap, there'd be you see people on their hand, on their knees mm -hmm. on the street thanking God for the military. But see, we can't expose yeah. them to that. And even now being- But assume and know that that happens. But it happens. Yeah. It happens. And what Downrange Podcast does is gives you a tiny glimpse uh -huh. of, of things that may or may not have happened. <laughs> I'm trying to be you know, careful here. I was very <laughs> that, correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that has led to a safer nation. You'd be surprised at what you can get out of the podcast by listening to the Downrange podcast series because the stories are so raw. Mm -hmm. And then when you add the music to it and you add the actors that are, you know, uh, coming behind and filling in the gaps and you add all of this other stuff to it, it'll suck you in and it's suck, getting you sucked in. The brain will start turning. Yeah, I think everyone can take away something from this exactly show, this show exactly and you're a great host man yeah, no nah, thank you you, bro. you you've crushed it and <laughs> thank uh you, it's been a blast man thank yeah, you for thank you man coming up to me nah thanks for having for me for our shades on interviews yeah yeah, cool yeah i've had yeah, so far yeah, absolutely but appreciate cheers, you man. Yeah. man thanks man of course yeah yeah thanks for having me on it's been a absolutely blessing, man. man talking to death is a production of tenderfoot tv and iheart podcast created and hosted by Payne Lindsay. For Tenderfoot TV, executive producers are Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Co-executive producer is Mike Rooney. For iHeart Podcasts, executive producers are Matt Frederick and Alex Williams, with original music by Makeup and Vanity Set. Additional production by Mike Rooney, Dylan Harrington, Sean Nerney, Dayton Cole, and Gustav Wilde for Cohedo. Production support by Tracy Kaplan, Mara Davis, and Trevor Young. 
Mixing and Mastering by Cooper Skinner and Dayton Cole. Our cover art was created by Rob Sheridan. Check out our website, talkingtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of Talking to Death. This series is released weekly, absolutely free. But if you want ad-free listening and exclusive bonuses, you can subscribe to Tinderfoot Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to tinderfootplus.com.